One more thing. One more thing. One more thing. Apple has always been the company making its own markets by taking existing ideas and products and molding them into a vision that nobody else can. This tone was very much led by Steve Jobs, who wanted to create the Disney of tech. Well, you know, we're working on a bunch of great stuff, but I can't talk about it. There used to be a saying at Apple, isn't it funny, a ship that leaks from the top. And the first time he left Apple, the company almost died without him. Upon his return, he recreated the magic of innovation that the company had lost and tried to build the company into an extension of himself so that it could survive long beyond his death. However, that continuation of his vision hasn't really been tested. Until now. You know, the, the, the fundamental problem here is that headphones are a miraculous thing. You put a pair of headphones and you get the same experience you get with a great pair of speakers, right? There's no such thing as headphones for video, right? There's, no, there's not something I can carry with me that I can put on and it gives me the same experience I get when I'm watching my, you know, 50 inch plasma display at home. And, you know, until somebody invents that, you're gonna have these opposing constraints. So I have my thoughts on the new Vision Pro and how I think it'll play out and what they're trying to achieve here. But to really understand how important this product is for the future of Apple, and just how massive a test this is for the company in the post-Jobs era, we first need to understand why Steve Jobs was so adamant to try and create a structure that could outlast him and continually innovate going forward. And why this product in particular is very much trying to recapture and recreate the kind of vision that he brought about during his time in the company. We view the home now not as a market really, but as a location in which personal computers are used for a variety of functions sometimes. So in the 80s, Jobs had already taken the Apple One and then Apple II that Wozniak had very much been the focus point in creating to global success. He had made the company an enormous giant in the computing world and was set on hunting down then massive company IBM. Now though, he wanted to show that he could create a visionary product and was more than just a glorified salesman. He created the Apple Lisa project, but was quickly thrown out the door at that one. He then appropriated a small team within Apple to work on what would become the Macintosh. This product was meant to be a cheaper Lisa that could go into the home of every house in America. It was a big vision. Now, Macintosh was developed by a small team of people less than 100, and you're gonna have a chance to, to meet and And when it was uh, complete, its launch became, still to this day probably, one of the most iconic and famous technology launches of all time. Helped in part by the fact that he got Ridley Scott to launch it in a Super Bowl commercial. Jobs, though, was fought on every part of the project thereafter, from price to marketing. And while he had some blame for its failure due to not giving it, for example, a fan, the product quickly started to drop off sales-wise after the initial excitement he had created gave way. The board weren't happy. Jobs was completely removed from his own company, and the Mac ironically ended up keeping Apple alive as it became the darling of the desktop publishing world. One of, one of my largest wishes is that we build next from the heart, and that people that are thinking about coming to work for us or buying our products or who want to sell us things feel that. Now that they were separate, Apple and Steve Jobs would have very different turns of fortunes over the next decade. Jobs started next, which while a commercial failure in many ways, was a historic success. And he also famously bought a small department of Lucasfilm called Pixar and began turning it into what would become a legendary animation movie studio. Meanwhile, Apple was selling variations of computers with the Mac moniker and losing massive market share to Microsoft and a slew of PC manufacturers. They did though try to innovate with a mobile computing device called the Newton. And after years of struggle, Apple eventually bought Next, primarily to get Steve Jobs back, who came in as a consultant when Apple was roughly 90 days away from bankruptcy. And he very quickly took consulting to a new level removing the CEO, taking over the board, and planning to turn the company around as quickly as possible, installing himself as the interim CEO, or IE CEO. 
She will almost certainly have come across Jonathan Ives' work, from trendy offices to sex and the city. His designs are everywhere. They're cutting-edge, sought-after must-haves. Ive, a British designer working in America, transformed computers from boring beige boxes into colourful, almost sculptural pieces for Apple. What happened next was nothing short of spectacular. He found a young industrial designer called Johnny Ive and an operations guy called Tim Cook. And together, they would be unstoppable. They first revived the Macintosh line through a new line called the iMac from a design that Johnny Ive had drawn up. This is the colorful computer that saved Apple, the Mac that stands out as one of the most historically strange designs in computing history, but was so colorful and enigmatic that it brought people to the company once again. Then they moved away from traditional computing and created the iPod, a product which would reshape the future of the company. Then they began playing with a multi-touch glass panel, which would go on to reshape the company once again. When I saw the rubber band, inertial scrolling, and a few of the other things, I thought, oh my God, we can build a phone out of this. And I put the tablet project on the shelf because the phone was more important. And the iPhone, followed by the iPad, would become so giant that Apple would soon become the most valuable company in the world. They were on a run of success that seemingly could not be stopped. Apple is confirming uh, that Steve Jobs has passed away after a battle with pancreatic cancer. But then Steve died. This sent shockwaves around the world. The reaction was incredible and really signaled how big of a mark on the world this once failing company had made through its enigmatic visionary of a creator. Prior to his death though, he wanted to ensure that the company, unlike the last time he had gone, would survive the tribulations of time. It would know how to recreate the magic that he had instilled over and over again. And he began working on that before he passed. He put some changes in place in the company that he believed would allow it to have the vision to continuously create groundbreaking products forever. He made the company's engineers and designers the real bosses. He trained Tim Cook to become a new version of Jobs himself, but one that could understand that his job was to look for product visionaries and let them flourish. One of the bigger parts of the ways he could do this was that the engineers and designers would never have to worry about cost, and there would be one PL sheet that would be managed by Tim Cook and his team, and therefore they could create while the team of business people would have to figure out how to make sure that it was financially stable. The company was instilled with the Disney style that he wanted. Groups of creatives working with and against each other to create the best products. And most importantly, the company would seem like magic by never announcing anything until it was ready, specifically not showing how the sausage was made. He created the tech equivalent of an Imaginarium. And we like to talk about the post-PC era, but when it really starts to happen, I think it's uncomfortable. All of this now, though, needs to be tested. It hasn't been tested since his death. Sure, they've created the Apple Watch, but in many ways, that was an extension of a product that was already catapulted to wild success by Jobs and his teams. And by that, I mean the iPhone. The watch was very much a calculated risk in a way and was a small risk for a company at the size of Apple at the time. They could easily scrap it and still move on. This product though, the Vision Pro, is a big gamble into an industry that's going to take a lot of development cost and it's going to mean that the company is going to have to force its will on a market in ways that it hasn't done since Jobs died. And worse than that, it's going into a marketplace that huge companies for about three decades now have tried and failed to make a success. The good news is though, at first glance, this product feels very jobs to me. So they unveiled this new product at the WWDC conference and it had been talked about for a long time. However, what they would launch wasn't really known by anybody. There was a lot of speculation. And when they came out on stage with essentially ski goggles, the type of thing we've come to expect from VR headset creators, it was a little bit of a worry for me watching it that this was going down a path more Newton than iMac. Sure, it had the stain and polish and intricacy that we've come to expect from Apple designs with blush glass and aluminium, but it wasn't until they switched it on and demoed it that we really got to see that something magical was being created here. 
or at least something that they could portray as magical. Compared to any other VR design, this was above and beyond and really is the type of product that only Apple could gamble on. It has cameras and sensors beyond anything else that we've seen in VR so far. It has eye tracking technology that the company has worked on for eight years now and has been able to develop and test across the world thanks to being able to put similar sensors into its other products that it's sold millions of. It's spatial audio that it's going to use to give you immersive sound. It's been testing in its AirPods with millions of customers for years now. These are the types of things that it could perfect before releasing that no other hardware company would have been able to test in the wild. Meta hasn't been able to. On top of that, they were able to pitch a design that just made sense compared to every other VR technology. It allows you not only to be immersed in your own digital world, your own home cinema in the wilderness, but also to switch back and allow you to integrate with other people as well, using the meme eyes that they kind of came up with at the front, which look a bit ridiculous, but in some ways make a lot of sense. From an industrial design standpoint, this makes sense. It doesn't close you off from the world, and more importantly, it means that you can use it without taking it off. And through all of this, a lot of us, I think from the outside, we're still skeptical because in many ways, a lot of what we saw in the demos, you don't expect to work as fluidly as apparently it does on this device. Because I've used a lot of VR headsets over the past decade, and a lot of them have not met the expectation. The quality of screens haven't been as good. You have to use silly triggers, and there's a lot of different situations where it just doesn't work perfectly. This, by the look of the demo, worked perfectly, but I wasn't really sold until I heard MKBHD say this. The eye tracking in this headset, as it looks at your eyes and keeps track of where your eyes move around, is the closest thing that I've experienced to like magic. Like I don't, I normally don't call tech things sort of magical or surreal like this, but this was, even for a pre-release product, kind of unbelievable how well it does. And that right there is what stood out for me. They had someone who deals with brand new technology every day describing something as magic. And also things like the fact that you can just pinch to zoom on this is very much a reimagining of the pinch to zoom on the iPhone, something that is so trivial now, but was so game changing in 2007. Does it still have some silly quirks that I don't think Jobs would have let pass? Sure, the battery and silly battery cable is akin to me of the magic mouse where you have to put it on its back like a turtle to allow it to charge. These are things that I think Jobs wouldn't have let go out the door. He would have waited an extra three years if he had to. But I think it's the right trade-off for the company. And the product, the more I look at it, and the more I hear reviews from people who used it, works like you would expect an Apple product to work. Sure, there's nothing really new here. All of this technology has been available in a variety of devices over the past few years. From incredible eye tracking, to the screen technology, the hand motion tracking, to AR and VR itself. None of this is new. In fact, VR has been around since before the 90s. But what Apple has done here is what they've become famous for. Taking a bunch of technologies and combining it into one cohesive story that when they're apart is just technology, but when they're together is almost like magic. All it takes is a special helmet and a glove and you're off. You see, Meta, Google, and Microsoft have tried to enter this space, but there's one key component missing. Steve Jobs' Disney magic. What Apple has done so well here is that they've made a product that is aspirational. They've made three to four things on this work incredibly well, enough to get the early adopters in and create a product for which price-wise, at least, is out of the reach of most. So while many people will say this is priced too high, Apple has done what it's been doing with the iPad, the iPhone, the iPod, and even back to Belisa and the Macintosh themselves. Creating a product that isn't for everybody, but a product that will create a benchmark for future success. A product that sets them as the aspirational goal, and most importantly, allows them to control a market and grow a market to their whim. Because no matter what anyone else creates now as an AR or VR headset, people will always say that it is like a Vision Pro, much like it took Samsung years to get over the fact that their tablets were always compared to the iPad. 
or how their phones were always compared to as a cheaper version of the iPhone. So in many ways, Apple has achieved what it needs to already, even before this thing hits the market. They've gained that Steve Jobs magic. The big test now is, can they make it work out in the real world like the iPhone did and like the iPod did? Because while it's very easy to demo something on stage or in front of a controlled environment, a product out in the wild is very different. So while there are obvious reasons why the price might seem too high, Apple clearly decided to go the Jobs route to make a benchmark product and tell a story of how it'll change your daily life and make it so that everyone wants to get into the exclusive club and then over time, start opening the side doors. Subscribe.